Hi, everybody. I'm Zan Sprouse. It's Zan Sprouse in the house and uh, ready to talk some Twin Peaks as we start the final leg of our journey with the return. So sad. Episode, well, part 13 of the return. So after this, we now only have five more episodes to go. Oh my gosh. And uh, there was some news that came out this week um, that apparently Showtime is interested in the idea of a possible Twin Peaks season four, depending if, of course, David Lynch is interested. That's the rub. Yes. That's, I don't know the, tri- if that's Lynch- the trick, isn't yeah. it? I don't know who interested David Lynch is going to be. It would be, I, of course, would love it. Right. And I would like, well, now this is. I think, I think they've got plenty of stuff to still left to cover. I think there's plenty of stuff we could cover. We could, and we could branch out. You know, this is not a, the original series did set itself up for being kind of one note with who killed Laura Palmer. Right. But I think this had so many different storylines going that it could, it could continue. We could continue with. This could almost be like an anthology series. Right, or can continue with all the other people that were following Bill Hastings' blog and the Zone, and yeah, uh, it could There's... be the Carl Rod spinoff. I'd watch that. But... <laughs> the, and the Carl Rod show would be just a fantastic. I would love that. I'd love that. <laughs> every, every he... there'd be a premise like you know, every week he goes around and helps someone new in the trailer park or in the right. in he's the like, neighborhood. Seriously, he's like the Doctor Sam Beckett of the trailer park. <laughs> he helps everybody out, and so oh boy, oh boy. And, what? and don't wake me up before 9.30 a.m. Ever. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> Striving to make right what once went wrong <laughs> after 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> after a damn, or a, a cup of Good Morning America. Good Morning America. <laughs> <laughs> I, part of me wants to see what David Lynch would do with some of, some of the characters we've lost. Right. And part of me doesn't. You know, the more we get into this series, the more sort of depressing yeah. Story yeah, yeah, and, the, and this episode is a great example of this. See what I did there? Yeah, I see what you did. That was a fantastic <laughs> setup. You just teed that one up nicely and set them up. You knock them back. You obviously have this down cold by now. <laughs> For someone new to the podcast game, you're 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 pretty much a pro right now. As far as I'm concerned, you know what the deal is. So well, I'm not new to I'm not new to obsessively discussing things though. So. There you go. So, which, you know, hey, that works out great for podcasts. So that works out great for podcasts, especially this podcast, because, yeah, so that's what uh, we do here. Exactly. So we're yeah, we're going to talk episode 13. And uh, let's start off, of course. Um, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, exactly. Dun, 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 dun. Get ready and go in the conga line because a wrong has been made right and the sun is shining bright. I so, <laughs> those Mitchum brothers. That was, a, that, that are, was yeah. That was a. I think that was a Bradley. I think it was a Bradley. Line. Yeah, J- the Jim Belushi character. Yeah. Yes. So. Yes. But uh, yeah. So yeah, we begin with the uh, Mitchum brothers and Dougie, who's surprisingly into this conga line. <laughs> um, and the and the ladies, the yeah, Candy, Mandy, and Sandy. Candy and Sandy. Yes. Yeah. Because you can't go anywhere without Candy, Mandy, and Sandy. Why would you? If you had them to to not do the things you asked them in a timely fashion, wouldn't you bring them along too? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, if nothing else, you know, hey, it makes you look good because I candy, of course. No pun intended. So, or I Mandy. Or I, or I Sandy. I see what you there did you there. All right. So, yeah, they do a conga line through the Lucky 7 Insurance and they're all happy, naturally, after getting that big $3 million. Big, $30 million. Thir- oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. It was. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. So, yeah, it was $30 million, uh payout um, brought to them by Dougie. Yes. And uh, so they're dancing right into Bushnell Mullen's office. And they give their thanks um, with the form of three gifts. Uh, a box, almost like, hey, you know, three wise men, practically. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, a box of Monte Cristo number two cigars, a monogram diamond cufflinks, a set of my monogram diamond cufflinks, and the keys to a brand new Beamer. 
Just like the one that Dougie has now, too. Exactly. So, uh, Bushnell is obviously very taken aback. Um, but somebody else is freaking out in the office. Anthony Sinclair Anthony, does not know what to do. Yeah, well, it seems like that's his normal thing of not knowing what to do. Because, yeah, so Tom Sizemore's character, Anthony Sinclair... Uh, is watching all this down the hall and immediately ducks behind his desk. Because, he's like under his desk, like yeah. where he is, you know, where his legs go. And he's like making yeah. a phone call. It, it's like, it was like, he like he, his desk has become like a foxhole or something that. <laughs> right. He, and and he's, he, he's like under his desk, like calling Duck and Todd yes. going, what do I do? He's still alive. <laughs> Anthony Sinclair, office ninja. Office. <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah. So yeah, he's dug him behind the desk and he calls up Mr. Todd and um that's uh Todd is Duncan Todd is obviously not very happy. He says you have one day to finish Dougie off. Right. Anthony Sinclair says you said two days. He's like, yeah, it's one day now. Yeah. You screwed it up, so now you get less safe. Yep. Exactly. Well, I would think that Anthony's the kind of guy you have to give an ultimatum to. Yeah, because he's not going to get... He's not... He's... Yeah, but remember, yeah, because Duncan Todd's under the gun from mm-hmm. um, Doppelganger Cooper. Right. So, yeah. Right. So he's just, like, pushing that that stress level downhill. I think Doppelganger Cooper doesn't really want Dougie dead, because if he did, he would just call in Chantal and Hutch. That's what I'm wondering. Why doesn't he just go to his A game? We're starting to get like Batman levels of trying to kill somebody here. You know, right. I'm going to string you up over over a pool full of piranhas and have a candle under the under the rope that I had you strung up on, and then I'm just going to walk away and assume everything went fine. Or if you're really serious about it, why would you just like send a pack of hitmen after Dougie at once, as opposed to just one guy at a time? Or that, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like, I mean, I, I can understand not wanting to send a pack of them because that does become a little bit conspicuous, right? But it's almost but becoming I, like like um, Peter Sellers in the you know the Pink Panther movies. <laughs> um, I forget, I forget. I think it was like either Revenge of the Pink Panther or Return of the Pink Panther. One of those where uh, he get a, a one of the bad guys sends a bunch of hitmen one at a time. Like if one follows him to an Oktoberfest. And whatnot, and I think that's revenge. It's not return. Yeah. I know. Okay, that. it must be revenge. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, so yeah, one at a time they try to take him out, and just through sheer um, clueziness, or in this case, with Douginess, yeah, um, that uh, the assassin gets taken out. So right, and that's the thing. I mean, and we have some. You know, we have we've tried with Ike the Spike, and that didn't work. Yep. And now we've tried setting him up with the Nitchin brothers and that didn't work. And of course, you know, Anthony Sinclair is not going to kill him. Yeah. Well, and for obvious reasons, which we'll get into. Right. And so, yeah, maybe, I mean, the, maybe, really, maybe, maybe, you... maybe that's, that's the next step is to bring in Hutch and Chantal. Something. But yeah, do you really think that Anthony Sinclair was going to be able to do this himself? I mean, he's kind of a, <sighs> yeah, kind of a not in the face, not in the face, little weaselly guy, you know, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. 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 And this is, this episode was great for just showcasing that. So, um, so Anthony ends up going to the uh, Las Vegas Police Department later in the episode. Uh, Who are apparently in with Duncan Todd? Yeah, find out. Yeah, because there, there's some. There's a couple of cops that are out back smoking, mm-hmm. and so you know they're no good cops because they're out back smoking. And uh, Anthony hits them up for. Uh, something to um, you know, like some poison or something to take care of, um, Dougie. Right, something that's undetectable. And yeah, because obviously be he's five... not going to just shoot him with a gun. Because hey, that would be easy. Right, right. it's going to be five thousand dollars. Yeah, and you know, go here and get it, and you know, it's going to be. Yeah, it's, it's going to cost supposedly you. undetectable, but yeah. Right. Yeah, and apparently, right. yeah, uh, the cops has no resp- respect for Anthony because he is such a weasel. Yes. And uh, so, so then um, Anthony ends up meeting up with Dougie, 
and the two of them are just going to have coffee and hang out together. So the next day, um, there, Anthony's waiting for uh, Dougie in his in the lobby, and buys him a Cooper or a coffee at um, this place called Zyman. S- Which is Z- where that's where he and got the pie, and that's where he got the pie, right? Yes. That's what I was yeah talking about last week because yeah, there's it's apparently it's not uh, boarded up. It just yeah, for, maybe or it just looks curtain, maybe it just looked, looked like it. It looks yeah. like it was boarded up, but yeah, apparently. yeah, it just looked like it a little bit. Yes. So, and it makes a little more sense that it would have pie, yeah, because it's a coffee shop with pie. Exactly. Why they put it in a moving box? That I'm not sure. Right, but still. Well, maybe that's the only box they had at the time, or something. Maybe they were they were out of boxes, but they still had pie. So who knows? <laughs> who knows? Or you know, it's the same place that um, uh, what's his name in seven get, got his cardboard box. Uh, what's in the box? What's in the box? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so uh, Dougie ends up taking a sip of coffee, and. Then suddenly gets up because in the distance he sees uh, that there's like where, you know, he can go to the, the Zyman's place and get a piece of cherry pie. Right. So he walks over there. Right. Shuffles over there more like. Shuffle, well, right. He yeah, the, shuffles over the, there. The, and old, then... the old waiter shuffle. Exactly. And then and he, and he even does say coffee. He does. I know. It was so you're like, okay, I've seen this before. Right. So so then um Anthony Sinclair puts the poison in Dougie's coffee. Mm-hmm. And so then he goes into the Zyman and she's like, Do you want some pie? Go sit down, I'll bring it to you. So he he comes back and then he is sort of looking at Anthony Sinclair's back and he sees like dandruff on his neck. Yeah. And he starts like playing with the dandruff, playing with the dandruff, yeah, playing, playing with the dandruff, They're pushing at it, You're like kind of poking at it, trying to figure out what, well, yeah, just trying to figure out what it is. And then, so Sinclair just kind of breaks down and he's like, I'm sorry, Dougie. And then he runs in the bathroom and pours the coffee in the urinal. He can't do it. I, and he, I, he, and he th- the, phone, the hilarious part, he throws the mug in the trash can. And of course there's a guy standing there at the urinal with a total like deadpan delivery going that bad, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the worst coffee I've ever seen. But there was part of me when he grabbed that mug that wondered, yeah. is he going to drink that himself? I kind of wondered that too. I thought it was like, okay, is he just going to turn total chicken shit and just like, okay, I got to, I have no way out of here. I'm like, game over, man, game over. And right. <laughs> so, so he, I just can't do what I can't. And I thought he was going to yeah. maybe drink it himself, but yeah. no, he, he pours it down the urine. Or, or that he would get confused about what mug he was going to put it in and then thought he passed it over to Dougie and then turns out he drank the real one. Oh, if you know, only he it, spent the last 10 years developing a resistance to Iocane powder. Exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty sure I bet, that's what and, that. and Dougie would, po- would be like, put poison in both cups. Poison both cups. Poison both cups. That's what, both that's cups. what he's, yeah, both cups. <laughs> New shoes. New shoes. Iocane powder. <laughs> <laughs> so... So they so they're up in Mullen's office and Anthony Sinclair is confessing that he's working for Duncan Todd. He's totally and, he's totally broken by this point. Yeah, he's he's he doesn't even care if Duncan Todd kills him because he can't live like this. He hasn't slept in months and Yeah, he says something like 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 I was vomiting blood and you know, like I can't live like this anymore. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I don't even care if he kills me because I can't live like this. And Mullen says he's not gonna press and Mullen says that Dougie has already told him, which of course we know that Dougie didn't really tell him anything. He just drew some pictures on some stuff, and right. he says he's not gonna, he's not going to told him in air quotes. Told him, yes. Told he's, him. Yeah. He's not going to press charges if he testifies against Duncan Todd. And so I kept thinking this is enough like an interrogation that Cooper, okay, he's had some coffee, right. he's had some cherry pie. Now he's in an interrogation. Come on back, come on back to his Cooper. Yeah, it, it just seems like, yeah, you've got all the ingredients. So what it's going to take to finally, you know, finish cooking? I don't know. I feel like we've had... We've I don't, had, know, I don't know what's left. There's something we're missing, and I don't know what it is. 
the I think it's going to be I think it's going to be Gordon Maybe. or Diane. I don't know or an FBI badge. I'm not sure what it's going to do. Yeah, it's going to be something like that. Maybe he sees the yeah. blue rose. I don't know. Ooh, maybe. I don't know. I'm just speculating. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, come on already. We got five episodes left. We got to see Cooper at some point. Come back, Cooper. That, that'll, be the, that'll be the final scene is like, yeah, we see Cooper back. And like, Ugh. Yeah, exactly. Mm. That would That's, be that would so be just the kick in teeth. Yeah, like, and David Lynch is totally trolling us. Last scene. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that Although would, that would be, that would be clever. But it wouldn't exactly be. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be well received. Satisfying. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would be. Up, it would be upsetting. So. Yeah. So yeah, internet meltdown. At that mm. point, I'm pretty sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So that we're, So that's kind of where we're left off with Anthony. Is that uh, yeah? He's he's. Bushnell wants him to to flip on Duncan Todd. Right. So we'll see where that goes. Hopefully, soon. Right. Um, our next story. Uh, what? What? Who's Roger? Who's Roger? Do we know who Roger is? I'm not sure. Who is Roger? After, after Duncan Todd talks to Anthony Sinclair, he says, Roger, can you come in here? Like, is that somebody we've seen before? I don't know. I think it's just his assistant. Yeah, I don't know. I'm yeah, not I sure if that's supposed to be anything. Yeah, I don't think it is, but who knows? It's Twin Peaks. Yeah, who knows? The most insignificant character could be like the key to the whole damn mystery for all we know. Right, exactly. So in one way, that's kind of cool because, like, you have to kind of pay attention to everything because it might yeah. matter. Or like we were saying a few weeks ago that that how I always felt that the scene with Annie in bed with Laura in Fire Walk With Me seemed really tacked on. Right. But in kind this of, series. Kind of, kind of superfluous. Right. But in this series, it makes it's a big deal. Right. Or at least it was ex- like it was uh, incorporated yeah. In, into the new storyline so that it mattered. Right. Right. So we, we, you know, that wound up being something. Eventually it made a lot of sense. Yeah. So who knows? And then of course, Dougie goes home and Sonny Jim yeah. has the most blinged out gym set I've ever seen. Yeah, this I whole... want to play on that thing. That thing's awesome. Yeah. So, so yeah, Janie E um, signs off on, her re- family's reward from the Mitchum boys, which turns out to be, yeah, like, like you said, this pimped out jungle gym set. It like lights up. It's awesome. It's got, well, it, here's the thing. Yeah. It's, it's all decked out in like, you know, like, um, fair lights, mm-hmm. state fair lights. Yeah. And, and it's got like, um, a roving spotlight. Yeah, what is <laughs> which kind of like reminded me a little bit of the giant. Yeah, a little bit of the giant or the flashlights in Owl Cave. Right. Yeah. Or the flashlights in the woods. Yep. So, um you know, like for also when Wyndham Earl brought um uh Annie into the Black yes. Lodge. Right. Right. That whole, that whole so. sequence. So yeah. But I don't know if it matters or not, but again, it's Twin Peaks. So, and then of course, Janie E gets a nice BMW, white BMW, and it's got a nice big red bow on it. And she's all, and she's all just like, Dougie, you're the ginchiest. I love you so much, Dougie. Sonny Jim is in seventh heaven. Yep. So presumably Dougie Dougie, Dougie's like, getting lucky again tonight. Probably, yeah. And then again, and then Dougie just says, Seven heaven. Yeah. So. <laughs> I I hope that I no matter what happens, I can with Cooper was... and Ducky. I hope Janie E and Sunny Jim do well, and I think that's part of what this is. Right. Is that they're setting it up for when he's gone, somebody's still going to take care of them. Probably. You know. Yeah. Because yeah. well, I mean, he's his whole this whole. It seems to me this whole purpose of the Dougie storyline is to have Cooper as Dougie going around and affecting all these lives for the better. Right. Like the uh, the slot machine lady, Janie E and Sonny Jim, because obviously the real Dougie, if there was a real Dougie, was failing miserably at that. Yes. And now all of a sudden, you know, like... 
all those problems have been fixed by Dougie. The mm-hmm. whole uh, Bushnell Mullins, even the Mitchum brothers, yeah, seem to be better off. Right, everybody's better off. The the old lady in the casino. Yep. Everybody who comes across him is the only person that really has we really haven't seen again is the child of the drug addicted mother that was across the street. Yeah, from where yeah, he, yeah. What happened to Crack Mom? What happened to Crack Mom and her little boy? And what happened to Jade? You know, Jade's yeah. probably fine. Jade can probably yeah, take care of herself. Jade, yeah, Jade seems like she's yeah. okay. What she's doing, but. But yeah, what about Crack Mom and, and her kid? Yeah, I wonder what's going on with them. That's a good question. So we haven't seen them for a while. So 119. 119. 119. Yep. All right. So um, that's pretty much it for um, Janie E and, and Sonny Jim this episode. Well, uh, that and those, those idiot cops that get his fingerprints and just oh, throw yeah. them away. Yeah, the Fuscos. <laughs> The Fuscos, yeah. Yeah, so, Which, yeah. We should talk about that because, um, yeah. So that that whole sequence right before Anthony shows up at the, at the LAPD or LVPD, excuse me. Um, yeah, they get they finally get Dougie F- Cooper's fingerprints back. You know the ones that they got off the coffee mug, right? And you know they it, it apparently it uh, you know so. It gives them the uh, the details that oh hey, it's someone who escaped from lockup in South Dakota, and I, he's an FBI agent. And then they just start laughing, and then they throw them out like yeah, this like, is obviously like wrong. A, yeah, this is obviously you know, like that's the biggest mistake, like biggest effing mistake ever. Well, and you want to you want to you just wonder why the hell hasn't someone flagged those prints like they flagged Major Briggs's prints? Right. You know why isn't there something in the system? that comes up as restricted or something that will flag those prints when somebody runs them so they can track down where he is, especially since doppelganger Cooper is on the loose again. And Gordon knows that. And did they not notice that his prints were backwards to the guy that was, that broke out of prison in South Dakota? Well, one of the, one of the more interesting theories I'm seeing online about Twin Peaks, the return is the theory that um, these events, you know, is it future or is it past? That, hey, maybe some of these events aren't occurring in chronological order. Oh, and see, I want to I say something, yes. but I don't want to spoil something else for somebody else. Okay. I'll just, I'll just do that to you. Oh. You know what I'm talking about? Kinda. Mm-hmm. I think so. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, maybe it's something like that. Maybe you're right. Maybe. But, but I just yeah, just remember that that the giant um, stress that you know is it future? Is this future is it, or is it past? Is it past. Yeah. So and that that was pretty much setting like that was in the premiere, in the in the very first scene. So I kind of wondered if that was like, hey, that's something you need to pay attention to throughout the entire series. That you hmm. may not be following things in chronological order. Yeah, that's a good point. So it's just it's it's a, one of the theories that's out there percolating, but uh, and there's no fish in it. But um, thank God, yeah, fish in a percolator. Don't drink that coffee. Don't drink that coffee, fellas. Don't drink that coffee. <laughs> I miss Pete Martell so damn much. I I miss Jack Nance so much in general. Oh, he would have been so perfect for this. Um. So yeah, I just uh, you know just one of those theories that I'm, I'm always it's in the back of my head as we're reviewing this stuff. Okay, so um, Doppelganger Cooper gets pretty much the big storyline this week. Oh my gosh. So this, oh, d- yeah, I'm, Go- I'm older now, so I don't yell at the television as much as I used to. Yes. Oh man, did I, <laughs> what the F just out loud. Like, wait, wait, ah! I, remember, well, I remember you texting me. Yes. Going <laughs> WTF Richard. Just text you in all capital letters. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes exactly. Which so, was, yes, which so was def- awesome. That, that definitely made me smile. So yeah, Doppelganger Cooper, you know, rolls up to yeah. a to this gar- to this. He opens the the code to the garage, and and yeah. Ray is there. The black pickup it, truck that he got from um, Hutch. Yes, from Hutch. 
and he's not Ray is not happy to see him and you know Renzo is like how did how did he know the code well I gave it yeah. to him it's like he didn't expect him to show up he thought he was dead yeah which is so, understandable because right. hey he watched him get shot and then the woodsman came out and like scooped Bob out of him presumably. exactly just scooped pieces out of him and so I can't blame Ray for thinking he's dead yeah so and so Renzo you know Ray wants to just shoot him while he's in there yeah Renzo's like, no, let's have a little fun with him. And that is famous last words. Yeah. Now, Renzo, for to explain this, Renzo is the boss of these ga- this gang out in western Montana. Right. So, yeah. So he's basically this big, bald, muscular dude that apparently is in charge because, hey, he can beat everybody at arm wrestling. That's what makes you their boss. Yeah. And so they challenge him to arm wrestling. And if, you know, basically if he loses, they're going to kill him. Yep. And if he wins, he gets to be their boss. And doppelganger Cooper says, I don't want to be your boss. And they said, well, what do you want? I want him. And he wants Ray. Right. And Ray's just like peeing his pants at this point, I think. Ray's freaking out because, you know, who, you know, now the boss has never lost a... Uh, an arm wrestling match, right. but um, obviously is in for more than he expected in this episode. He's in for much more than he expected. So a rude awakening. So they start their arm wrestling. So we go full over the top, like Sylvester Stallone. Full. We start with over the top. I'm surprised there wasn't a backwards baseball cap. <laughs> there, we, we need to watch the gang again. There's got to be one in there. Has to be. So we we start with the arm wrestling and it starts over the top. Yep. But it ends like the fly. <laughs> it's yes. Not oh yes. Yeah. That's it's a, not as That was a beautiful reference by the way. I'll, thank I'll, you. The Cronenberg the David Cronenberg. The Cronenberg from fl- yes, fly. David Cronenberg yes. fly. So it's not as it's not as well. It's all brundle the fly. Arm, yeah. The arm is not as gruesome but it gets just about as gruesome. So what happens is yeah. is they're they're arm wrestling. And it looks like Doppelganger Cooper is going to lose. He's about, you know. He's almost to the table. He's, yeah, he's like 80 degrees down. Yeah. And he's like, you know, he talks about how, you know, it kind of hurts when you do that. It's like starting position is more comfortable. It hurts when you do that. And he raises it right back up. Right back up. And then he says, see how it hurts when I go like this? And then he pulls Renzo's arm down. And Renzo's freaking out. He's like, you know, actually struggling to. to Yes. And, and, and. Doppelganger Cooper is eerily calm at this point. Very. Just staring right at him with those beady black eyes. And, yeah, just he keeps kind of toying with Renzo's arm. Right. He's sort of, he's like, let's go back to starting position. It's much more comfortable. And then they do that a couple more times. And then Doppelganger Cooper kind of gets tired of playing. Yep. And not only brings him down on the table fly style. Yep. But then punches Renzo in the face to the point where his face is concave. Like his yeah, nose is on the it, inside it's now. It's caved in. Yeah. It's, it is caved in. It's like, so, it's like, it's like if his face was made from clay, like an, yeah, an and art class it. and you just punched your fist into it. That's what it kind yes. of looks like. <laughs> so like I said, it's not, the arm isn't the gruesome part yeah. of this situation. It's the, it's the concave face. Yeah. So, all of a sudden, he's the boss now. Yes. So now all of these cronies that were rooting for the other boss are now rooting for Doppelganger Cooper. They've got Ray. They're going to hand Ray over. Yep. He wants some cell phones, and then he shoots Ray in the leg. Well, yeah, let's yeah. First, he's all like, you know, bitches leave. Yeah, he is kind of bitches <laughs> leave. Yeah, that's true. And he's like, you know, I just want to talk oh, to Ray. I want to talk and to Ray alone, please. Now, apparently, though, there's there's this one guy. This little guy who looks like an accountant. Yeah, he's that kind of that kind of lingers. Yeah, he's just like, "Do you need any money?" And and Doppelganger Cooper just kind of looks at him and goes, "No, I don't think so. I don't think so." And it's like, you know, who is that guy? Was he the was he the accountant that had really bad gambling debts? And I don't I don't know, but now works in this garage. Suddenly, now I want to know more about the accountant guy. I know, like, where did he come from? (laughs) So he's in a room alone with Ray. Right. 
And all the other guys are watching. Again, it's closed circuit TV. They're all watching through that. Yeah, they have this big ass monitor screen. This hu- yeah, this huge monitor. It's like a it's like a two hundred foot television <laughs> screen. Yeah, I know it's huge. It's just it's just for watching people die. I guess I don't know. What uh, yeah, the hell. apparently. Yeah. I don't know what the hell this gang does in their free time other than arm wrestling. Like, the, like they're in this it. really shitty warehouse type thing, but they have this humongous two hundred like inch television. Right, and they just they just they lock people in rooms and watch what they do. So. Yeah. He wants to know who hired Ray to kill him. And Ray says, I don't know. I never met him. I only talked to him on the phone. His name is Philip Jeffries. Yep. So Philip Jeffries, shout out, yo. So he said that there's something inside you that they want. Right. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if it was Bob. I don't know if it was the ring. I don't know I was if it's thinking Cooper. It was, I was thinking it was Bob. I wasn't sure if it was Bob or if it was Cooper. Yeah. And then they he asks he asks Ray, did they ever mention a major Briggs? Mm-hmm. Ray says no. He says no, and then he shows him the ring. He's got the yeah, Ray's the, got the ring. Yeah, the ring, as in yeah, don't in, take the ring, Laura. As, yes, the ring. And he said he had orders to put it on Doppelganger Cooper after he was dead. Yeah. And then a guy dressed up like a guard gave him the ring before he went, he got out of prison. Right. And he probably didn't do it because, you know, he wanted to get away from the woodsman. So that's why he still has it. And doppelganger Cooper tells him that he needs to put the ring on his left hand ring finger. Now. Right now. And he says, you know what I want? I want the coordinates that you got from Hastings secretary. Right. And so, yeah, so he it dares him to reach into his pocket. So, yeah, he pulls it. Um, Ray pulls out the coordinates and evil Cooper looks at him. And then he asks, oh, yes, where Jeffries is. Here's the thing, though. But before that happens. Yeah. We cut back to all the guys in the room. Oh, yes. Watching this go down. And Richard's there. What is Richard yes. doing there? Richard Horn. So, so apparently Richard, if the, the chron, again, if the, the chronology is right, if after killing Miriam or Try. trying, trying to kill Miriam, thank you. Yes. Trying to kill Miriam. He hightailed it out of Twin Peaks and apparently did not stop for anything until he hit Western Montana. What is Richard doing in with these people? This that you're that going got back me. to Missoula, Montana. You're going back to Missoula, Montana. Yeah, that was that had me messed up in the head. Yeah, like, just what the yeah, hell you're just like, I, 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 what? <laughs> and I was seriously, I was like, what? <laughs> that that got me. Yeah. So so then, yeah, so, so, he's so, so in this, of course, Richard, is this the whole? Is this the first time Richard's actually seen his probable father? I have no idea. Or is he there? Because I don't Because he was really staring hard at that screen. He really was. And he was really, he was really interested in what was going on. If Richard isn't Doppelganger Cooper's progeny, uh, because of presumably raping Audrey in her coma, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to explain it because that seems more and more like the likely scenario here. Or is Richard drawn to Doppelganger Cooper because of Bob of some in some way? Yeah, something. Like I don't that. know. I don't know what's going on. I'm just going to let this one ride. But or, that, or is he something like a, like a simulacrum like um, Dougie was? Oh, hmm. interesting idea. I'm just. Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. But yeah, that, who knows? But that, again, that's. I'm just trying to like. I'm throwing theories out. I, I I almost did like one of the cartoon like rub my eyes yeah. thing. I'm like, is that real? Oh my god! Yeah, he was. So what, then you didn't obviously didn't expect him to be there because hey, this no. is a completely different storyline, and then boom, there he is. Exactly. How would they? How is this all going to connect? So, um, well, it's got to start connecting at some point. This show, please connect so, it up. Yep. So, uh, so yes, yeah. He so asked, he asked where Philip Jeffries is. He says he doesn't know, but he heard he was at the Dutchman's. Now, we don't have no idea what the Dutchman's is, but no. apparently Doppelganger Cooper knows exactly what it is because as soon as he hears the word Dutchman's, bam, Boom. 
shoots Ray in the head. Right in the head. So, yeah. So, Ray's dead. And Doppelganger Cooper goes over and watches as the ring disappears off of Ray's hand. And then we cut to inside the Black Lodge. It lands on the waiting room floor. Where Ray is on the waiting room floor, bleeding out. And the ring um, ends up on the, like, um, it gets picked up by Mike, who sets it and, back up well, on we that, think, the we table. We think so. We, we, don't, we only see a hand. We're right. assuming. It, it, it was kind of his jacket. That's true. And he literally puts the ring on a pedestal. Right. Yeah, it's and, a, that same pedestal that we've seen in Fire Walk With Me. Right. Right. So. What does that mean? And the deleted scenes for Fire Walk With Me. Right. And did, am I the so, only one so, that... So that, that kind heard... of... Like, well, that kind of gives us... So this kind of gives us a better idea of how um, some of these souls end up in the Black Lodge through that ring. Like, we actually get an idea of the purpose of that ring is to convey those souls... And we actually see it happen right into the Black Lodge. And apparently That's... it only happens when they're dead. If they're right. dead wearing the ring. So which is why like Laura didn't Respect. enter the Laura didn't enter the Black Lodge until after Leland killed her. Right. After she put on and the ring. That's you know, and Teresa Banks Right. You know, and the and the ring was found on the piece of dirt by the trailer. Right. So yeah. But that's uh yeah, and, and am I the only one that is hearing uh, Flash Gordon noises when he picks up the ring and puts it? <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then um, Va- Max von Sydow as Ming the Merciless starts laughing. He laughs, <laughs> and then, then, he, then we hear Queen. <laughs> <laughs> the end? Question mark. The end? Question mark. Oh, yeah. so good. And yes, it was because come on. <laughs> yeah. Doctor Who. Doctor Who did a great send up of that, by the way. Oh, did they? Yeah, yeah. In the um, in the at the end of Last of the Time Lords. Okay. Um, which was the uh, this uh, with the tenth Doctor, David Tennant, and John Sim as the Master. After the Master is killed off, or is he? Of course. Oh yes, I remember yeah, this. Now. So so yeah. what happens is his the you know the Jane, John Saxon's wife. Um, the the this. Earth woman that he, the master married to pose as, as oh, that's Prime right. Minister yeah, Saxon, picks, Harold yeah, Saxon, excuse the, me. Yeah, she picks up the ring. She picks up the ring. And yeah, just exactly shot for shot, I think, of the Flash Gordon scene. Nice. Yeah, so that was cool. Little Doctor Who shout out there, but yeah, little digression. Um, so yeah, and that's, that's kind of uh, where we're left off with that storyline. Oh but, my gosh, but, but, crazy. But that was all kinds of crazy, yes. So yeah, you not only get to have Richard finally present presumably seeing his dad, you got the end of Ray and some more uh of the Philip Jeffries mystery. Yeah, what's going on with Philip Jeffries? Yep. So that was a big deal. Um yep. now we talked about Hutch and Chantal, they only show up very briefly. As they're eating head- Cheetos and talking about Mormons. Yeah, they head- they're heading at this point. They're on the highway passing close to Provo, Utah. Yep. Which, of course, gets them talking about Mormons. And uh, my wife's family is from Utah. So. Oh, yeah. We, we, we have that. We've pretty much had that discussion, just like Chantal and, and Hutch, only, with, <laughs> only without the Cheetos. Without the Cheetos, yes. But maybe the Wendy's wrappers, but, you know. Next stop, Wendy's. Next stop, Wendy's. So presumably stopped at Wendy's too. But uh, so yeah, they're talking about the Mormons not drinking. But uh, uh, but Hutch brings up, hey, I heard they can have like all kinds of wives, like up to six wives. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. like six or ten. Yeah. So so, so it wasn't a it wasn't a big scene, but uh, it, it happened. Mormon facts with Chantal and Hutch. Exactly. Mormon talk. <laughs> <laughs> Brought to you by Cheetos. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, what's that, um, the Broadway play by the South Park guys that, you know, the one I'm talking about, oh, the, one the Mormons? yes, yes, yes. The, um, I can't remember the name of it, but you guys, oh, you guys know the one I'm talking oh about. Oh my gosh. Why can't I think of the, why can't I think of the name of it? Yeah. The Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon. Thank you. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, 
the next new storyline is where we go back to the Double R Diner. Bobby comes in for some dinner. Yep. And guess who's there? He sits down with Norma and Big, Big Ed, Ed Hurley. Hurley. Yay! Yeah, so we finally get the return of Big Ed Hurley, um, which was great. But um, not great for Ed, as it turns out. Yeah, what is the deal here? So, um, Bobby's just like, well, you know, you guys are busy. I will leave you alone. And Like, do you want me to... Am I intruding on yeah, something? Yeah, he or? doesn't want he doesn't want to intrude, but Big Ed's like, no, come on, stay, we're good. Nothing's happening here. He nothing's says. happening here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, apparently nothing is happening there, and Big Ed is not very happy about that. So See, what, what's weird is that um Norma's lawyer comes to talk to her. Yeah. Is I don't know if it's a lawyer or if it's just like a um some corporate guy that she hooked up with and and sold her franchises or set up this franchise. I'm, I'm not sure who it is, but when, um, so maybe like a business manager, perhaps something. Yeah. Something. But when he, but when he comes over to talk to her, big Ed and Bobby say they're going to leave her alone. And big Ed calls her babe. Yeah. But then yeah. Walter kisses her. Yeah. So, and, that, and, and that's the thing is like, yeah, Ed's off. Ed goes off with Bobby mm-hmm. and he's watching from afar. Norma, he can see Norma, Norma can see him, but apparently because where this guy, Walter, who's played by Grant Goodeve, who, if you remember, was um, Rick from Northern Exposure, from Maggie O'Connell's dead boyfriend, if you watch Northern Exposure from back in the day. I had forgotten that that's who that was. Okay. So, yeah, that's Rick from from Northern Exposure, Uh, the guy who got hit by the satellite and fused with the satellite, if you remember that. (laughs) That's right. So, um... But uh, and he apparently has not aged a frickin' day, so I hate this guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so yeah, um, but apparently Walter has his back to Ed, so he can't see Ed. What's what Ed's doing? Right. So um, Walter apparently is uh, there to tell Norma that hey, three of their fr- five franchises. So the Double R has franchised. And they're turning a profit, but the flagship location in Twin Peaks has been down for the past few months because, hey, they're spending too much on pie, as in the they're, ingredients. The ingredients cost too much, and Norma doesn't want to doesn't want to compromise on local and organic ingredients. And the other stores are using the same recipe; they're just maybe using some cheaper stuff. Yeah, and apparently so Norma's, Norma's not happy about this, but no. she's going along with it. Right. She says, I've, we've heard from other people that the pies just aren't as good. Mm-hmm. And so he's trying to get her to use cheaper ingredients in the pie and to rename the diner with her brand, which is Norma's Double R. Yeah. So, so. they want to rebrand the Double R. And right. Norma's all like, it's been the Double R, just the Double R for the past 50 years in Twin Peaks. That's what people know. Right. So, and Ed is just staring daggers at Walter. If point. looks could kill, that guy would be dead by now. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty yeah, much. Ed's, Ed's not happy. And I'm not sure what's going on because... So, yeah. So these two kids, after all this time, still have not gotten together or figured or out how to get together. Or the didn't work? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, don't I don't know, know what either. happened. So... Nobody is happy in Twin Peaks, apparently. Apparently not, because also Becky calls and Steve hasn't been home for like two days. Which is probably good for her. That's probably good for her, yeah. But you know, if he's going to show up, you know, dead or yeah. in jail or something like that, that's hopefully, she, a- hopefully she's not going through the DTs. Seriously. So Norma says, not Norma. Uh, Shelley says, "Come, come down here, and I'll get you like big piece of pie with ice cream and whipped cream." Yep. And she's yeah. like, "Damn, you okay?" Damn, that sounds really good. Okay, fine, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> So, I, I think uh, everybody can understand that feeling. Yeah, you exactly. talked me. You talked me into it. You talked me into some pie. So we don't. So, we don't actually get to see Becky show up. No, this, we this don't. This week, maybe next week. But we just know. All we know is that Steve is still missing. Yeah. So anyway, I'm not quite sure what's going on with Ed because we again. Yeah. Over at Run Silent Run Drapes, we see Nadine, but I don't necessarily see. We haven't seen Nadine and Ed together. No, we so have not. So are they still to, are they that. still together? 
I, yeah, who knows? But so Dr. Jacoby stops by Run Silent, Run Drapes, where there is a display of drapes with a golden shit shovel in the window. Yeah, he's, he's driving by, apparently, and then slams on the brakes and is all excited, bangs on the door repeatedly until Nadine comes to the door. And she's so excited to see him. And, yeah, yeah. And so, so they talk They talk for a while, and they're, like, kind of adorably flirting with each other. Yeah, they are. Apparently, this is, like, the last time they saw each other was, like, seven years ago. Mm-hmm. Nadine was on her knees looking for a potato. It she was, dropped it, one at the grocery store. She was, had to find it. Yeah, there was a big storm that day. So if he's doing that. He's doing that thing that you do when you like somebody and you remember the last time you saw right. them, and it's really vivid in your brain. Right. right. So they're they're kind of adorably yeah. flirting with each other. Yeah, there was definitely some spark itch going on there. Yeah. So I don't know what's I don't know what's up with that. So maybe at least Nadine will be happy. We'll see. Who? Yeah. Who knows? But uh, yeah, and of course Nadine's talking about it, her, you know, silent drape runners still. Mm-hmm. They're completely silent. silent. So after all this time, of course, she still hasn't let it go. And now she's turned into a business. So she's doing this for us, Ed. Right. Who knows if anybody's actually buying anything from that store, but. Hell, I would buy that in a second. I actually need new drapes. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, if I could get silent ones from Nadine, that would be amazing. But after watching this show, I wouldn't recommend the red ones. No, 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 I don't. Yeah, those those are because, you know, there's part there's part of me that wants red drapes to have like a whole twin piece thing. Diane, but I'm a little too Diane afraid of might it. come through them. Let's rock. Let's rock. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. While so, we're still in Twin Peaks. Yes. Well, we, we should kind of keep going with Ed. Because okay. Ed is kind of the closing credits in this episode. Ed is just sitting there watching cars go by eating soup. Yeah, it's the most depressing thing, the sight you could ever imagine. And he's at the gas farm. It's a, he's it, not even at home. He's at the gas farm. Yeah, he's at the gas farm. And he's just all kinds of lovesick, sitting alone, slurping up some soup out of a cup, drinking co- coffee while staring out the window facing the street. And the credits are rolling. And suddenly he picks up a small piece of folded paper, sets it on fire. What fire, on walk paper? with me. Is that what the paper said? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, maybe it's the actual paper yeah. from, from that mound of dirt. Yeah, I have and, no and, idea and, what and that he watched, was. And he watches it burn. Now, fire, obviously, yeah, there's, that's, has a, that's a big, strong metaphor in this show. And I'm thinking, like, is that soup all he has left of Norma? <laughs> I hope it wasn't Garbon Bozia. Ew. Oh, yes. Was it soup or was it cream corn? Well, it was yellowish. That's true. You never know what it was. Yeah. But um, so I, thought, I thought it was like maybe some kind of tomato soup. but Something or like a chicken and dumplings yeah, or something yeah, like that. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. But. but yeah, he's not even at home. So he's not with Norma. He's not with Nadine. He's at the gas farm eating soup by himself. So... so so he he looked very dark, and only when when he was lighting that thing on fire, I'm, I'm getting this very dark vibe from Ed. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with Ed, but it's sad. Now here's here's what I'm wondering: Is the gas farm have any connection to that gas station of the Woodsman? See, I uh, I'm not sure if that's if it's the gas farm or if it's the convenience store that it is well I, th- I think it was intended to be the convenience store but they they were talking about the like they lived above a convenience store but th- that mm-hmm. convenience store didn't have a like a building above it did it at least back then in the 50s you see that's the thing i'm not sure so i'm not sure Unless what they the... added one later yeah i'm not sure what the reference was supposed to be but i you know it could very well be yeah but I just, I just kind of wondered if, like, the gas farm and the gas station mm. of the woodsman had any connection. Yikes. I hope not for Ed's sake. Yeah, I hope not, too. But, uh, yeah, it was very – it was it was interesting that, um, you know, they that Lynch made that the closer as opposed to the roadhouse this week. Right. But, right. but yeah, just, to, you know, like, I hope it – you know, you don't know if it's, like, just – 
just kind of like it was like a an afterthought kind of scene or if it has any significance yeah that's the thing i don't know either way it makes me sad yeah i'm, I'm yeah i'm kind of wondering if he's going to do something very unpleasant to walter at some point <laughs> yeah perhaps i don't know and those big snow white teeth oh my god seriously yeah so all right so so that happened um we talked about nadine so we, elsewhere in twin peaks we yes. go back to the palmer house yes we do and sarah is there doing what sarah does best smoking and drinking sm- bloody mary's yeah, smoking uh, her and drinking and waiting f- to die, apparently. Seriously. And Sitti- she's... Sitting there in the dark with her big big television. And apparently she's watching um, an old fight that had me wondering if this was the Bushnell-Mullins fight. I was wondering that, too, because they make such a big deal about him, you know, being yeah. a boxer previously. Yeah. And it's on... It's like on repeat. It's on it a only, loop. Yeah. It's on a loop and you only see about a minute of it. And then you hear this electric, electricity static it, noise. Yeah. It was very, and yeah. then everything starts over again, but she acts like she doesn't notice. She's right. just still sitting she, there watching she's, it. She's almost like she's in a fugue state. Yeah. And you know, she's maybe it's like a, like a hypnotic type thing because it was repetitive. Right. But it wasn't me you know, like, why would she be watching ta- a bu- tape of boxing match, an old boxing match on a loop of all things? Well, and I don't even know if it was intended to be on a loop because you hear that electricity yeah. noise or and was it starts it, over. Yeah. So was this maybe like a time distortion? Right. It's something else going on that we don't realize yet. Yeah. But uh, so, yeah. yeah, more questions because, hey, we don't have enough questions on Twin Peaks, obviously. Right. Right. But it was definitely electricity. Electricity. Yep. Yeah. Then next we cover, we return to Audrey, another horribly miserable person in Twin Peaks. And this this got weird. This got very weird. This got really strange. She's still, of course, he's still not, Charlie has still not told her what Tina said on the phone. Yep. And. Which is frustrating enough. Right. I mean, we still don't we enough. still don't get the story of what that was even after what? Audrey's yelling at him to tell it. Seriously. So then Charlie says he's going to take her to the roadhouse to see if Billy is there. She stops acting like she's not sure where she is. Yeah, she's st- this yeah, this was this is where Audrey's story kind of takes a n- very dark sudden turn. Cuz if you don't act right, I do you want me to end your story too? Yeah, that was really yeah, there was there was a what couple there was a up- Charlie, what does he have on her? This, what this the is, hell? This the whole thing. Okay, so yeah, she's like on the verge of tears. She's becoming obviously very, she's panicking almost a little bit at she this looks point. She's very frightened. Yeah, she she's frightened. frightened. Um, and so, yeah, she says, I feel like I'm somewhere else. Like I'm somebody else. Have you ever felt that? And what is th- that? All and then she tearfully says, "It's like Ghostwood here." Yeah, what so, does that so, mean? Ghostwood, shout out to the podcast. Ghostwood, Ghostwood. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Audrey, for shouting, giving it's... the podcast a shout out. Right, and but, so yeah, but yeah, so so okay. Why would she feel like she was in Ghostwood? And then Charlie says, "Do you want to stay or do you want to leave?" And she says, "I want to do both." Right. So what what is that? I, I have a feeling that means more than just stay with Charlie or stay home. Yeah. There's something else going on there. And does Charlie have something on her? What's up with her? And this is the thing I can't quite figure out because he says to her, do you want me to end your story too? Yeah. And then she says, what is the title of this episode? What story is that, Charlie? The story of the little girl who lives down the lane? Yep. And now for those of you who don't know, this is a book. Yep. By Laird Koenig. I was wondering about, if you were going to bring this up because, yeah, I was. Yeah, because I was Go. like, okay, wait a second. What's yep. going on here? The little girl who lives down the lane has pretty much been pulling a, um, oh, my, you just missed my dad. He'll be back yeah. <laughs> thing for about six months. Um, she, her parents divorced and her mother was kind of crazy and abusive. 
So her father took her away to this sort of isolated island, even though he was dying. Right. And so he commits suicide. He drowns in the ocean. And basically says you can stay here by yourself. So he's trying to keep, you know, and if, if your mother ever comes looking for you, give her this with in potassium cyanide. And so the mother did come looking for her. She killed her mother by putting potassium cyanide in the tea and the mother's embalmed in the basement. And anybody who's finding out about this stuff there, she's killing as well. So she's basically, you know, you know, her father set this up for her to be able to live by herself alone and isolated, but still self-sufficient. Mm-hmm. So she could stay away from her mother, but her mother came looking for her and then she killed the mother as well. So now, did, have you read this book? Long time ago, okay. long time ago. It's also a movie. Yeah. It's um, a 1976 Jodie Foster movie. Yeah. Jodie Foster is the little girl. Yeah. Um, so it's, I am not sure what the hell Audrey's talking about with this. Yeah, it's a, like, is there, like maybe because like um, that there's secrets involved about the, you know that absent father or that right. uh, because, you know there's suspicious neighbors or what have you. Exactly. Yeah. What is what is because exactly it was set in a small that. town in Maine, so we have that right. small town mystery secrets. Right. So I'm not exactly sure what Audrey meant yeah, by that. Yeah. No, and well, what does she mean by it's like Ghostwood? Yeah. And she also says, I'm not sure who I am, but I'm not me. Yeah. What exactly is that? And then Charlie counters, this is existentialism 101. Are you going to stop playing games? And then he says, you know, or, or am I going to have to end your story? End your too? story too. Which is, yeah. a, which is a very, you know, like a, a almost a, obviously a very veiled threat. And all of a sudden, Charlie goes from being like kind of annoying to being really ominous. So, so here's here's what I'm wondering: Is Audrey still in the coma? Uh, something's and, going on with her. And, and is maybe yeah. like Charlie, her doctor, trying to communicate with her and bring her out of this this comatose state, or is there something more supernatural going on? I, it could go, I have no idea. And she does ask Charlie to help her. She's, right. she wants, she wants his help. So it, it, she sees him as someone who can do something for her, but I just can't figure out what that would be at this point. Because obviously we don't know what happened to Audrey, presumably after Doppelganger Cooper saw her. Right. So she could still be in the coma. She could be out of the coma, but trapped in some horrible demonic place or did she get trapped in the woods yeah did she get trapped in, i have no idea what's going on here yeah we have no and idea. if the if if audrey is out in the ether somewhere is she what's making the noise at the hotel mm, that's a good question i know because we're thinking it could have been audrey it could have been josie but i'm not sure we're gonna see josie well i just mean i mean we could still see josie in the in the knobs, you know? <laughs> right. But I mean, I would think we would have heard some indication of, of Josie by now. Possibly. Even Possibly. a passing reference to Josie, but there doesn't right. seem to be any reference to Josie. Yeah. So yeah, I don't quite know what's going, but yeah, this, this really left me yeah, this with my was, jaw on the ground. Yeah. This, this was like, okay, you thought last week we thought that this whole storyline that was out of nowhere was just confusing and thought like, okay, this is just um, kind of like a rambling nonsense. But now it has these dark, dark overtones. Yeah. It's, it, it's and, ominous. And, and, Something and, and, bad is going on and, here. And, you know, last week, Audrey's coming off, like I, I mentioned, like Catherine Martell, but here she's kind of like back to that old vulnerable Audrey that we saw in the original series. Right. Right. And scared like she was when yeah, she was kind of like at when one she was, Jack. Yeah, exactly. Like when I Jacks. So yeah, that, so it's it's returned to that vulnerable Audrey. Right, and she's nowhere near as able to stand up to Charlie like she was last week. Right, and unfortunately, I don't think her special agent is going to come rescue her at this point. Oh man! Unless 
Jack Wheeler comes out of nowhere. Oh, Billy Zane. How? Oh my God! Don't don't even. If he came to if, like if, if Billy Zane came in to Audrey's rescue, would you be just like, oh, my heart is melting. I'm just gonna melt. <laughs> I'm gonna completely. I'm gonna be like, you know, Frosty the Snowman on a July afternoon. I'm gonna be melted completely. That's awesome. Oh, that'd be so amazing. <laughs> I kind of want to see that happen just to get your reaction to it. Oh my gosh. It'll be that, you know, that scene in Amelie where. I've never seen that movie, so I'll, I'll take your word for You've it. You've never seen Amelie? Oh I my know. God. I know. I'm deprived. Oh my God. I have, okay. a, I have a wife that does not like foreign cinema, okay? <laughs> so. I think that you can't help but like Amelie. I think she would enjoy that. Probably she would. It's, it's And it's a Jeune and Caro. So the same people that did yeah. City of Lost Children, so which is one of my favorites. So anyway, yeah. there's a scene in Amelie where she likes the, the whole thing about Amelie is she likes this guy. He's sort of a mysterious guy, and she's leaving him clues to try and find her. Yeah, and she works at this coffee shop, which I do not understand how this coffee shop is still in business. It has like 17 employees and like three people who ever go to it. <laughs> so, so, it so it has more employees than customers. It has more employees than customers. And she's able to live in this adorable apartment in Paris, which I could not figure that out. And so I came up with this whole thing in my head. Her mother was actually killed by a falling gargoyle. Off of the church. <laughs> and she got an insurance settlement. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the Catholic church <laughs> gave her a settlement. And that's why she's able to live in this nice, cute little apartment, even though she basically makes coffee and writes the menu on. Those are the at, things you never see in French cinema. And that, yeah, you just, she does this, you know, this, she writes the menu up for this coffee shop that doesn't have any customers ever. Right. So anyway, she's writing on the menu and the guy she likes is in there and he's sitting there. Like it's a, the menu is glass basically. She writes on it from behind and then you can see it when you come in mm -hmm. and he, it's a partition and he's in the booth in front of it. And he walks out and she doesn't have the guts to say anything to him and so she just sort of sort of makes this forlorn face and then it's this computer effect where she turns into a puddle like literally turns into a puddle of water and splashes on the ground <laughs> that would be me that would be you that would be me yes <laughs> that's so. good that's cute that's, that's I love their love story I was I really liked that that love story I thought that was really cute hmm. that's interesting I liked Cooper and Annie and I liked John Justice Wheeler and Audrey um I wasn't a big fan of um, Gordon and Shelley. Right. And especially now that I know that Gordon has kind of like weird taste, like, you know. Well, when now, well now you want Bobby and Shelley. Now you totally want Bobby because and Because Bobby Shelley. has like gotten his act together finally. It's like you kind of like but, Bobby. But, but so Shelley's Bobby still guy. stuck back in the 90s. Shelley can't learn to not like the bad boys. She never left high school. Well, you know, she left high school too early is the right. problem. Yeah. Now she's trying to make up for it. Yeah. So. Or she's, yeah, I mean, she's the mom, but she doesn't like, she's more, she acts more like a kid than a mom. Well, I think she acts like a mom. Or, like a, but or wants, to be a, wants to be a friend as opposed to a mom to her daughter. I think it's, I think it's more like she's trying to teach her daughter the right things to do, even though she hasn't learned the lessons herself completely. That's, that's fair. I'll give you that one. Yeah. 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 Maybe she's like, you know, do what I say, but don't do what I do. Yeah. Do as I say, not as I do. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly that kind of thing. Got it. And then, of course, the most controversial scene in this episode, if you've watched, checked out the internets, um, we return to the roadhouse. We get the return of the MC. Mm -hmm. So the roadhouse is very proud to welcome. James Hurley. And so James, uh, he's this week's musical guest of the Roadhouse. And he is. what song does he play? Just you and, and I, I forever together. Now, okay. Yes. This was a, this was a weird moment for me. Yeah. Because I really didn't like this song. A lot of people didn't really like this song. I really didn't like this song. I really didn't like... I was okay with the song. I, well, the thing is, it's not the worst song in the world, but no. it, was, it was just another thing to take up time when yeah. there's things I want to know. 
Yeah. And that was my problem. And I wasn't a big fan of the James Hurley saga, that I, what I call it. I call it right. the James Hurley saga, where he runs away and he lives with that rich lady and yeah. she wants him to kill her husband. That whole thing, I was like, can we just get back no, to... Nobody liked that saga. Yeah, can we get back to this? And it's not that I didn't like James. Right, he was fine when he was just with Donna and talking about Laura. I liked I liked James. I just didn't like the James Hurley saga because I think there could have been more with James. Yeah. You know, with his with his you know drunk mother and all of his issues. Or if, they would, I, or if they would have let him be one of the bookhouse boys helping Cooper in the in the gang. I thought, yeah, that was the thing, because he kind of was a bookhouse boy already, yeah. so maybe he could have stayed and helped out. But I don't know. Yeah. Um, if he had stayed, maybe Bobby and Mike would have gotten to him. I don't know how that. I don't know what happened. But so I never was a huge fan of this song. But now, but when I when I heard yeah. that opening guitar, I like actually got a little choked up. I was like, oh, yeah. And you know, it's amazing. It's amazing what nostalgia will make you forgive. <laughs> exactly. Well, a lot of people in line apparently did not forgive. Okay. Um, yeah. So this was like, yeah, you know, everybody was just accusing Lynch of the ultimate troll by like all the, <laughs> like, because, well, here's the thing for the reasons you mentioned that, you know, that this song was just completely out of place back in the original series because you, it was taking time from the, the, the main stuff we wanted to get to. And it was just such a random scene that all of a sudden James sits down, plays guitar with, with Donna and Maddie as backup, as backup right. singers. Um, it was just so out of nowhere. You're like, okay, when did they decide to put this together? Um, with all everything that's going on. Um, so it's gotten a lot of flack over the decades and still is getting flack. But so when it it's coming off like that, David Lynch was aware of the criticism and is like, okay. F you guys. F you guys. I love this song that we wrote together. I love this guy. I love this song because, hey, I co-wrote this song or whatever. Uh whatever. So Angelo and I don't give a rat's ass what you think. We're putting it in the show. Exactly. We're putting it in the show. Screw you guys. I'm going him. (laughs) So, yeah. So, so, yeah, exactly. So it was just like like this big F you to all the critics that have, you know, and, and I think that was kind of like part of the uh, premiere episode because James having gotten so much flack from fans that, that, well, he, that he put in that line that James is still cool. He's James always, been, has cool. always been cool. Right. And that's the thing, James, I really like the character of James. I thought James was a good character. I, he was so good for Laura. He was, he was good for Donna. Right. You know, and it, I, I'm sorry if, if Doc Hayward likes you, you're a good guy. Yeah. Just end of story. Yeah. So I, you know, I do like James. I just didn't, I didn't like that. He, he wasn't, got, it wasn't the flaw in the character so much. It was, it was the flaw in the storylines. It was a flaw in the storylines. Exactly. I've said the same thing about Wesley Crusher. Yeah. Not a bad character. He yeah. wasn't a bad character. He had bad writers. See, and that, and that's the way I feel a lot about characters that, are you know like a lot of fans look down on it's like and this is coming from me being the from my writer background there aren't bad characters there's only bad writing exactly now there and, are characters you know, like you're a, supposed to hate but right. then you love to hate them that's like exactly like a jamie lannister yeah you're supposed to hate him although and although, him. although now he's you kind of see him on that road to redemption but cersei you still really hate oh you hate her you yeah, despise you her. She is her. she's a fantastic villain to hate. It, absolutely. But absolutely. But she's compelling. Mm-hmm. She's so, compelling and you don't hate her because Right. Like Joffrey. Joffrey sick. Joffrey, you loathed Joffrey with a passion. You wanted him to die horribly, right. but he was interesting. Right. You kept you you watched because you wanted to see him die. Yes. You know, there's not I mean you don't or, the, and also what he was gonna do next. You can't you, you don't hate them because you're sick of them. You hate them because they're horrible people. Right, right. You know, it's it's like But yeah, see James, I just, you know, I think James started out okay, but like I said that that whole saga with him and that lady that he lived with, I was like, why is James getting mixed up in something this stupid, you yeah. know? Yeah, it was and just, so it was so let's such soap opera cliche and Yeah, it was very it became it became like, hey, hey James, I want you to come kill like help me like you know, kill my husband, kill, my, kill, kill, my, kill, oh, kill, kill my husband, kill thing. my husband so I can like get hook up with a chauffeur. 
Yeah, that was really crazy. Who's really, who's really my boyfriend. Yeah, who I say is my brother, but he's really my boyfriend. Yeah. It just became, it became Invitation to Love. Exactly. It was like the, the soap opera within the soap opera. I wanted to watch Twin Peaks. I didn't want to watch Invitation to Love. Yeah. So, um, and that song, I would have liked that song, maybe if it was like a Chris Isaac. I just didn't like that high voice and I didn't yeah. like the... Yeah. The girls sounding they were like they were on lewds. There were things I didn't <laughs> like about it. But and again, I think I didn't like it because I didn't want to watch that scene. Right. I wanted to watch them find find what happened to Laura. They had they had things to do besides sit there and sing. But so, but, but now here in the context of the return, which is yeah. kind of like a completely different animal than the original series. There was something about it that I said just kind of got me. I was just like, oh, it's that. So, you, so as far as you're concerned, it clicks better this time around. I think I think it clicks better this time, and I think it says something about James. I think he's. Does this mean James has never? Did he come back to Twin Peaks for Donna? Yeah, we, he, well, we don't know because you because know, one of the, the, he's singing the song to this girl named Renee. Yeah, and we haven't seen her since part two, where mm-hmm. she's in the booth with Shelley. Right. And we kind of wondered if, like, at the time, we wondered if James and Shelley were going to hook up. So I just, I wonder if James is trying, maybe, James. Maybe he's in he'll... love with this, you know, like, maybe he's hooked up with a different girl named Renee. I don't know. But it's like, James, I get the feeling that James has been running for a long time. And yeah. now he's back and he's trying to dis- rediscover who he really is. Maybe. Which is why he's. You know, he's at the Roadhouse playing this 25 year old song. Or maybe he like went off and had some kind of musical career. But you think he'd have different songs. I, well, well, then maybe if, you know, that's the old standby, you know, hey, let's maybe, let's play yeah, for the, the, local, the local crowd. Yeah, maybe. But again, you know, like you would think, well, hey, that was my song with Donna and Maddie. And <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. It, it's. Um, that, is that his go to? Is that his go to song? You should never have the same song for for different people. Yeah, exactly. It just gets weird. Yeah, and what that that part was a little weird. Yeah. Um, but you know, if if okay, like maybe he went off, had a career, came back for this girl named Renee, and he's singing to her, and she's all weeping, moved by the performance. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. But I think it's one of the things I find it really interesting is that we haven't heard James speak. No, we haven't, because uh, this is probably the same audio from 25 years ago. It is the exact same audio. As far as as I can tell, it's the exact same audio. It sure sounded like it. I mean, the same chords, note for note. Right. I mean, mean, even if even in a a reconstruction, you'd hear some difference. Mm -hmm. But. I listened to that pretty closely. I've seen the episode twice. Yeah. Could not. And I, and I listen to just you and I on CD all the time because it's all on the, the season two soundtrack. Mm-hmm. So I can't hear a difference. So if, that, there, yeah, if there's, if there's a difference, I couldn't yet. hear it. Yeah. He hasn't said anything. Yet, and so the that's... backup singers sound like the original backup singers from that yep. were, you know, that um, Donna and Maddie dubbed over or, you know, like, mm-hmm. so. Yeah. So, yeah. Who knows with that one? But uh, I actually thought that was kind of a cute scene. Yeah. So because I'm I'm at the point now where I'm used to the Roadhouse meaning we're done here. We're going to listen yeah. to some music. You know, I just have to live with the Roadhouse being the end. So. And then we got I, the button. Then we got the bonus Big Ed depression scene. Right. Right. So maybe there's something. Maybe James came back because Big Ed needed something. I don't know. That would be nice. Uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, James will actually integrate into Big Ed's storyline. That'd be cool. And hopefully get him out of these doldrums. But, oh, uh, Ed. but I love yeah. Big Ed. Yeah, but I th- but uh, the vibe I got here is again, it's David Lynch saying, you know what, I don't care what you got what you people think. I like James Marshall as James Hurley. I do too. And uh I'm gonna use him and I don't care if you like it or not. Yeah, I like him too. So I kind of respect that in a way. Yeah, I, I think mean, there's, like I said, there's nothing wrong with James. James had a dumb story. Yep. So, you know, if nothing else, it shows that 
how loyal to his actors uh, David Lynch is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And loyal to his characters. Yes. You know, David Lynch is not going to pull a George Lucas on us. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm suddenly thinking about the South Park episode of where uh, Indiana Jones gets raped. By, oh my god! <laughs> by, by, by Lucas and Spielberg. Oh jeez! <laughs> now that you brought oh, that geez. up, yeah. It was it was great commentary, but man, it's brutal. It's brutal. <laughs> uh, it's 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 harsh, but it's it's pretty dead on. Mm. Um, so I think that's about everything about this episode, unless I forgot something. No, that's pretty oh. much it. Okay. Yeah, there's not there wasn't a whole lot going on apart from the really big uh Doppelganger Cooper scene. Yeah, that was crazy. And then of course a lot of crazy moments and obviously the very dark turn with Audrey's storyline. Yeah. So Yeah. Charlie kind of gave me chills in this episode. He really he scared me. He did. I mean that moment, yeah, when he said, you know, like uh, like oh, uh, am I going to have to end your story too? What the hell? Yeah, that I mean, was, that just that made scary. Me, I was when I watched that the first time, you know, I just I told her I like, what the hell is that? Mhm. So Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. It wasn't. So, uh, what's your rating for this episode? Uh 8 out of 10 gym sets. Nice. Very nice. I gave it 8 out of 10 lonely cups of soup because oh. aw so, poor big Ed. Poor big Ed. Hopefully, hopefully it's big so Ed. Hopefully big Ed gets his groove back next week. That would be nice. Yeah, it would I be. would like to see. I would like to see big Ed. Um, yeah. Have somehow. something good happen to him. Yeah. Somehow, big Ed and Norma got to work this out. Somehow they got to figure something out. I mean, we, they're they just need to be together. Yeah. Or something. Because, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. yeah. Because they're they're both you know once again they're just, I don't know if it's just they're afraid of t- commitment to each other, or or what's going on there, but or just did they just or did, maybe Ed hard. was re- maybe Ed was ready to commit and then Norma ended up hooking up with this Walter guy who pulled her in all know. these like directions and they fell up their romance kind of fell by the wayside as Norma wanted to build up yeah. up the double R empire, right. So, so I, you know, I don't, or like maybe just things, you know, they never seem to play the same cards at the same time. Yeah. So, but, uh, yeah, so I thought that was, uh, yeah, that's, you know, we'll see where that goes. But, uh, so we're both in sync, eight out of 10. Uh, now I don't have any new feedback from Ivan I- Ivanov this week. Well, you know, Tanya's, Tanya's very little. He's busy. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, she's you know, apparently Tanya is probably in therapy, so that's that's probably because remember he did say that he was. That's supposed the thing. To, if she falls asleep to us, yeah, she's got. Yeah, yeah, she's got to be in therapy right now. So, right. but uh, hopefully not seeing Doctor Jacoby. But he lost his license, so that's true. He did. He did. But uh, maybe you know she gets maybe she gets a golden little mini golden shovel. Aww. <laughs> That'd be so a little a little boom boom shovel. Yeah, exactly. A little boom boom <laughs> to shovel your way out of the boom boom. Shovel your way out of the boom boom. <laughs> That's funny. So uh, obviously next time uh, we're going to talk about the return part fourteen. Mm, <sighs> These numbers too close to the end. I know we're getting way too close to eighteen for my liking. So, yeah, me too. We're getting so, we're getting really really close. Yeah, and then uh, after that. Um, Yours truly is going on vacation for a couple of weeks, but uh, we'll be back and scrambling to catch up afterwards. We'll be back and catching up. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but uh, for right now, but we will be back next week. So uh, stay tuned for the return part 14. And uh, if you want to get in touch of us, cause Hey, Yvonne, we miss you. Um, you can reach us on the Facebook as all the crazy kids are doing at um, the Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast Facebook page, and you can also reach us at Ghostwood Cast on the Twitter machine, or you can email us, which works out just well, as at at ghost or excuse me Ghostwood Podcast at gmail dot com. So either one of those three options are available. So please do that, and also please, if you're not already. Uh, please subscribe to us and uh, on iTunes and rate us if you would, because that helps people find us. 
I noticed yes. I noticed on the iTunes I checked it recently that we are showing up on the when you do a search for Twin Peaks and if you scroll down past the TV episodes and albums and whatnot to the podcasts. Now we're not on the main page, but if you scroll all the way to the end, we're there. So hey, we're grouped there. But I think that we maybe if we get enough people, that'd be a little closer to the main page. So that would be kind of cool. If yes, if you sub- yes, if you subscribe and rate us, that would be amazing. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. So, but uh, if, if you've done so already, thank you very much for doing so. And uh, yeah, please like us also on our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. That would also help. But uh, we appreciate those of you who have already done so. So thanks for that. Absolutely. Thank you. We just love that somebody's listening. Exactly. And, uh, and a shout out to everybody that's listening to us on YouTube. Yes. Hello, YouTube. Yeah. So, hey, Vesuvi. Thanks for uh, listening to us on YouTube. So cheers for that. Yep. So um, as for you, Zan, where can they find you? I am on Facebook as Zan Sprouse. And I am on Twitter and Instagram as Udinax19. And please. For those of you who are wondering how to spell that, that's Xanadu spelled backwards. Right. So pretty sure you can figure it out because you're obviously very bright people because, hey, you're listening to our podcast, right? You like Twin Peaks, so you think about things. Yeah, exactly. So just just pretend it, pretend it's being spoken to in the Black Lodge and reverse it. Right. Pretend it's the man from the other place telling you. Yeah. Ooh, the next. <laughs> Ooh, the next nineteen. That'd be so great. What yeah. about you, Charles? Where can you be reached? Well, obviously, I'm at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine and at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram, uh, where I recently posted some f- stuff from Wizard World Columbus. That's right, you did. Including some nifty photos of Catherine Tate, John Barrowman, and David Tennant. That was crazy. That was crazy. Big old Doctor Who jamboree down there. Yeah, which was very unexpected this year, but very welcome in my opinion. Um, Long overdue in my opinion. But uh, John Barrowman, always a trip. He's wonderful. I met him and I told him my name and he said, what, did your mom take a lot of Xanax? Yeah. So yeah, he was. Uh, he yeah. got a, he got a kick out of my name. Yeah. So that was always fun. Yeah, and it was fun to have uh, John Barrowman and David Tennant have this little rivalry back and forth, which was great. Mm. Which was great That's because adorable. they they were a little rivalry about which one of them could r- ran faster on Doctor Who. Oh yeah, good question. That's pretty funny. Um, I personally am very uh, excited to hear David Tennant be uh, Scrooge McDuck. Yes, because yeah, he he did talk about that while he was there. Cool. Uh, yeah, and apparently they've, according to him, they've already re- started recording season two. Awesome. Even though the first season hasn't even aired yet. Well, that's the thing. It, it, you, it, with, with with animation, yeah, you have to record the stuff in advance because hey, it takes forever to do the actual animation. Or as they as they say on The Simpsons, they don't do it live because it's a terrible strain on the animators' wrists. <laughs> that's a that's a great line. <laughs> that's great. So. um and then, yes. uh, as also for me, that uh, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs, Google Plus for all you crazy kids on the Google Plus, and uh, my blog, Geeky Things. Damn good coffee. And hot. Damn good coffee and hot, which apparently you can now also get in mug form on the official uh, Showtime Twin Peaks store. Fantastic. They have shirts that say damn good coffee, but they have a coffee mug that says damn good coffee. And then you turn it sideways and it says dot, dot, dot and hot. Look at them advertising for you. I know. Showtime. Yeah, it was. So I appreciate you guys pimping my blog. Oh, even though I, Hey, I stole that title from your show, but we won't talk, but still. And they also have at the bottom of the mug, they have RR to go, double R to go. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty sweet. So I'm gonna have that to get. Is cute. I'm gonna have to get me one of them mugs. Oh yeah, I've got a. Uh, I've got a mug from. Got a mug that I bought at the Double R Diner, and it is my favorite right. mug. It's very well designed. Well, I have a. F- I have some friends that back in the day. I'm gonna show this to you, Zan. Obviously, you can't see that out there in podcast land. But a friend. So, friends like of, a, oh, look at that! Yep, they back in the day they made. Uh, me this, you know, because they know I had, a, I had a, I belonged to a, uh, Teen Titans writing group called Titan Talk back in the day for these okay. wacky things called amateur press associations. 
Oh. And we did these uh, little, before they were blogs, we did these things on paper and Xerox them called zines. Oh, I remember zines with the... Yeah, yeah. With the collating and the stapling? Yeah. So anyway, so fanzines is essentially what this was. So yeah, we did the whole collating and stapling thing. And my zine at the time was called Damn Good Coffee and Hot because, hey, I was a big Twin Peaks fan back in the day. Well, check that out. And I just resurrected that for my blog because, hey, that's a great title. You're not going to come up with anything better than that. Heck no. And since you guys can't see it, I'll tell you that that mug is where Charles keeps his sonic screwdrivers. Exactly. So. I, yeah, I got that in, that inspiration from the the Twelfth Doctor episode, the pilot that aired just this past season. Oh, okay, because he's got one of those on his desk at uh, the university where he's posing as a professor. So it's a great oh, little, okay. great little in joke. So um, from all the different sonic screwdrivers from all the different eras. So um, yeah, so please yeah please check out uh, Damn Good Coffee and Hot where I talk about Twin Peaks and. All kinds of comic book and TV news. Posted some recent news about The Flash and Black Lightning. And uh, my other podcast that I do, the Phantom Zone podcast. And uh, Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast that I do with Jesse Jackson. So please check those out. We definitely appreciate it. And I have to issue a correction from last week. Last week, I, uh, I stupidly said due to my foggy memory that uh the song tenderness was a an english beat song it is not it is a general public song oh so i just wanted to correct that however yeah i was wrong too i, I did go see the english beat last weekend yep. and they played tenderness now, <laughs> so. now english beat still did mirror in the bathroom right Yes, that was English. Okay, so I was right about that at least. All right. Good. Just just for they're they're only the English beat for those of us in the United States. They're the beat. Right. In their native land. Yeah. Um so cuz we didn't want to confuse them with the Beatles presumably. I thought it was because of Paul Carrick and the beat. It could be. I didn't think so of, I didn't think to, about that. I think that's that's what I heard at one point that it was because of Paul Carrick and the beat. Okay. Um, so that's why they had to add the English beat on there. So we didn't, uh, confuse the two, confuse the two. So, but yes, that's how we know them here in the United States as the English beat. That's how they are yep. marketed and things like that. So, yep. so they were uh, wonderful. They were great, but yes, it is. That tenderness is in fact a general public song. Tenderness. So. Where is the tenderness? Where is it? Yeah. I love, I love me some Dave Wakeling. That's great. He's pretty, he's pretty fabulous. All right. So everybody come back next week for the return part 14. I don't and like how high the numbers are getting. I know. And hopefully we'll get the return of Jerry Horn so I can use this. I think I'm high. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what? You think I was going to go a week without that? Come I'm on. so glad we didn't. I was, I was hoping we would have a, a good reason to use it, but you know, you don't need a reason. I don't it's need- like, it's like. It's like chocolate or cheese or puppies. Exactly. What's your reason? Exactly. <laughs> chocolate, cheese, or puppies. Yep. There you go. And Jerry That's Horn it. talking about how high he is getting. I think I'm high. I think I'm high. <laughs> <laughs> I like oh, that he's, stra- he's straining from the diaphragm on that one. I think I'm it's high. He's killing it. He's killing it on Jerry Horn this, this time around. So, yeah, hopefully we find out what, what Jerry Horn was running from. Last time we saw him coming out of the Ghostwood yeah. Forest. And does it have any connection to Audrey? And does it have any connection to Audrey and why she is scared of Ghostwood? Yep. So come on back, y'all. Oh we'll my be, gosh. We'll be here. And uh, we'll see you next time right here on Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast. Bye, bye. everybody. Bye bye. Doppelganger.